Have you guys ever heard about this phrase, déjà vu? Déjà vu, anyone? Déjà vu, however you say it. I'm not French. Déjà vu, what does that mean? It's a weird thing, right? How many of you ever experienced déjà vu? Ever in your life? I mean, I've experienced it. It's a French word that means already seen. And it's the feeling when, where you go somewhere uh, and you feel like you've been here before. And you've never been there. It's like you... Uh, you, you feel like, I've seen this before, I've heard this before, I've been here before, I've seen these people, but you've never been there. And it feel, it, that's, called deja vu, that's called deja vu. And you know, in, in the book of, um, the, the way the book of Joshua starts, by the way, you can turn to Joshua chapter 1, that's where we're going to be in today. The way the book of Joshua starts, it starts with this deja vu feeling. It's this feeling of, man, Israelites have been here before. They've been here before. We've read this story before. And it's very fascinating. The beginning of the book of Joshua is like this deja vu where we see the Israelites on the border of the promised land, the land that they were traveling to for 40 years. And if, we, if you know the story well, you know that they've been there before, 40 years ago. When the Israelites left Egypt and they escaped the slavery and they went through the, um, through the Sinai, Sinai, and I have a map here for you. So they leave Egypt, they travel in the wilderness, and it takes them pr- fairly quickly to get to the promised land, top right corner of, your, of the screen there. They get there and they see the, the promised land. They send out 12 spies. By the way, among those 12 spies is Joshua, the, the book whose this book is named after. Joshua is go, goes with the 11 spies and they seek out the land. They see that it's amazing, but they see that there's giants in that land. They come back and 10 out of 12 spies are filled with fear, doubt. And they're like, there's no way we can do this. There's no way we can enter into this land. It's not going to happen. And say, so they, um, they sow this, um, these seeds of fear and doubt into the nation and the nation is like, no way we're going in there. They don't trust God. As a result, through Moses, God says, you know what? Because you doubted, because you did not listen, you did not trust me, you're going to go back to the desert and you're going to spend 40 years there. So they go back and they spend 40 years traveling through the desert. And now, finally, after 40 years, they are at the same spot. Deja vu. They are the same. They're looking at the promised land and they're getting ready to enter and move forward with faith. And they are ready to step into this new season, if you will. They're ready to move forward, but as we will find out, that will require a lot of faith. It's not going to be that simple. Before they could move forward, specifically before Joshua could move forward, and he is kind of the main character of the book, he will need to work on his faith. And he will need, and what we will see today, God will teach some truth, some lessons to him, how to move forward in faith. And you know, as we are stepping into a new season, as a church, new season as 2022. I'm not saying that we're stepping into a promised land. Far from it, right? We're not step- we know that 2022 is not going to be much better than 2021. It's just another year. But there is this symbolic thing that we're stepping into this new season. And, you know, each one of us, we have some things to claim, some things to conquer and advance to, just like Israelites did. We have our hopes. I'm sure you have as a family your dreams, your desires. Uh, your goals, you have a calling to be fulfilled, things that God placed on your heart. And as church, we also have dreams. As house of the gospel, we also have things that we want to achieve, goals and hopes that we want to do as a church. And just like Israel, we must step into this season with faith. We must have faith and we must move forward, not on our own strength, but we must move forward with faith. Faith. So let's dive into this passage, into Joshua chapter 1, and see how we can move forward in faith. That's kind of the big topic, how to move forward in faith in Joshua chapter 1. So let's read this passage, these two verses. Joshua 1.1 1, 1 says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all the people into the land that I am giving to them, so that the people, to the people of Israel. 
So here we are introduced to this man named Joshua. How many of you uh, studied the man Joshua? I doubt not a lot of us because we, we like to talk about Moses, these big guys, but Joshua kind of gets lost sometimes in, 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 in between our studies. And, and we find out that Mo, Joshua was Moses' assistant. And he's given this title that he, uh, Joshua, the son of Nun. And right away you're like, son of Nun? What is going on here? I thought nuns cannot have children. This is weird already, you know? Uh, but it's a different nun. It's the name of his father, so don't get that confused. But we are introduced to this man, uh, Joshua. Um, I want to really quickly just to show you his life because this will kind of create a context, historical and his life context for us as we begin the study of this book. What you see here on the slide is you see the life of Joshua. With kind of, uh, his life can be divided into two parts. The preparation part for 90 years and the leadership part for 20 years. And that is divided by the death of Moses, by the time when he took over leadership in Israel. And the first part of his life can be divided into three parts. He was a slave in Egypt, he was a servant in the desert, he was serving Moses, and he was a spy in the land. Now what's interesting about this is that um, when God told the Israelites that you will be punished and you will spend 40 years in the desert, he did that for what reason? So the older generation can die out, right? So they can die out. Joshua is the only one who is left from the generation who left Egypt. So now as we begin Joshua chapter 1, he is the only one who remembers Egypt. The only one. And so you can see that he was born in Egypt. He went through the Passover. He remembers all those things. And so now he is here in this moment when Moses is dead and he is ready to take over. By the way, I also put a date there. It's uh, when Israel entered into the Promised Land, it was about 1240 B.C., just to give you a historical perspective, because the book we're reading here, it's not just a legend, it's not just something Christianity put together. This is a historical book. And so around 1200 B.C., just to give you a context, uh, about 100-something some, uh, miles to the northwest, a couple of hundred miles northwest, in a country called Greece, around that time, that's where the Battle of Troy happened. You've seen that movie, you've read the books, the stories. Around the time where Israel enters into promised land, things are happening all over the place. So this is a historical background and setting of this story. Point is this. We find Joshua in this critical moment of his life. He's 90 years old, he's not a young man, but he's never been a leader like Moses. And there's a lot of pressure on him. And this is where the first point that I want to point out from this uh, from the story, it's this. In order to move forward in faith, what Joshua had to do and what we need to do is we need to live in the present, not in the past. Live in the present, not in the past. Uh, my middle son, David, uh, when he was uh, a little boy, I was, um, when I was getting uh, ready to go to work in the mornings, uh, as I'm getting ready, he would go to the front door and he would find my shoes. And he would ta put on those shoes and try to walk around the living room in the shoes. Well, we don't walk in shoes in the house, so he was punished for that. But uh, I'm just kidding, he wasn't. He was a little kid, he doesn't know better. But now he knows better. Uh, but he would put on my shoes and he would try to walk around in the, my shoes. And I would have to kind of watch him because he could stumble and fall and he did not feel comfortable in my not that big, but bigger shoes. Because it's tough to walk in someone else's shoes, especially when they are much bigger. And you know, that is exactly where Joshua finds himself in this story. He is putting on big, big shoes of Moses, or sandals. He's putting on big sandals of Moses. And there's a lot of pressure with that. You know, Moses' Moses's presence loomed large and powerful over him. Imagine what it felt like to take over as a leader, and Moses is this large figure. Living in the shadow was intimidating, and Joshua compared himself to Moses. He knew he did not measure up to Moses. No doubt, at times, Joshua felt inferior to Moses. Additionally, again, we go back to this deja vu moment where uh, Joshua realizes that, man, 40 years ago, I was right here, and we failed as a nation. We failed. 
And with all of these past experiences, what we read here is just amazing. God had to remind Joshua, God had to tell him, Moses is dead. Face the fact, Moses is dead. For years I've been preparing you for this moment. You've learned from him, now it's your turn. I saw great promise in you a long time ago, and that's why I chose you. Quit comparing yourself, live in the present, not in the past. And then he says, arise and go. Arise and go. Before, because before Joshua could move forward and lead the nation, he had to realize that he must live in the present, not in the past. Have you ever been there? As a Christian, as a person, as a human being, have you ever been in those moments? You didn't lead nations and you didn't lead maybe large corporations or whatever, but have you ever been there where your past hindered you from moving forward? We all experience this. We all have moments in our past where our past hindered us from moving forward to achieve what God wanted us to achieve, to do what God wants us to do, to do maybe a certain ministry, to, do, to reach out to a certain person, to start a business, to do whatever God is calling you to do, but you're hindered, you can't go on until you deal with your past. Or maybe you're stuck in your past. And what's interesting is that that past can be good or bad. You know, Joshua did not just have negative experiences in the past, he had good experiences. And what can happen in our life is that bad things or negative things in our past, like our sins, maybe it's the time that I fell, it's the time that where I stumbled, or maybe it's some good things. You heard the phrase when people say, the good old days. And do you think those, that kind of mentality can't hinder you from moving forward? Oh, yes, it can. Living in the good old days can hinder you from moving forward. And you don't have to be old to say good old days. Maybe it was just a last year where you're like, man, that, those were the days. Those were the friendships. Those were the relationships. That was the ministry. God, I can't do that anymore. That can't happen. But God says, don't be stuck in your past. You know, Apostle Paul is a great example of this where Paul had a, some uh, rich background, let's just say. And he says this in Philippians chapter 3. He says, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. And he he says, if, if I can tell you one thing, if I can tell you one thing, here's one thing that I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on. Arise and go, right? I press on the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You know, on one hand, Paul had some bad past, some bad things in his past. I mean, he was pretty much a terrorist. He was terrorizing Christians, killing them. Before he became Paul, he was Saul, and he was just a really, really, really bad guy. But also he had some good, at this point he had some good things in his past, some positive things. He was the greatest preacher alive. He was the greatest missionary alive. He planted dozens of churches. He had a big following. And with all of that, in the past he says, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, good or bad, I strain forward to what lies ahead. Don't live in the past, live in the present, and move forward to the future. Is there anything from your past that, need, that you need to let go of? As you're beginning this year, and maybe you're dreaming and thinking about this new year, is there anything that you need to let go of in order to move forward, positive or negative? You know, and this doesn't just apply to us on an individual level, this also applies to us as a church. And this is where this sermon series was born, in a way. It's from um, a lot of meetings with pastors, with pastoral team, and, and thinking and praying about where we're going as house of the gospel. Do we just want to live in the past? Or do we want to move forward? Where are we going as a church? You know, our desire is that together this year, and when I mean House of the Gospel, I mean not just leadership team, not just pastors, I mean all of us as House of the Gospel, we need to move forward in faith. Now, we want to respect our past. We want to learn from our past. We want to be respectful of our past. 
of our traditions and our history, and that's all in its place and it's important. But if we want to be a healthy and a thriving church, we must live in the present and not in the past. God has a plan for our church, and I truly believe that. God has a plan for our church. He has a plan for each family in this church. God has a plan for each individual in this church, for each member and visitor of this church. And our desire is not to live based on memories of the past, but to make gospel advancing memories today. That is our desire as your leadership. That is our desire for all of us, that we move forward in faith. Let's continue with the story. The second point that I wanted to show from the story is this. In order to move forward in faith, we must affirm the presence of God in your circumstances. Here's what we read in verse 3. God says to him, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. How encouraging is this text? How encouraging is this text? Imagine how, how encouraging this was to hear for Joshua. I love how God reassures Joshua that his blessing and promises are not tied to Moses. Aren't you glad that God's blessings and promises are not tied to the hero of, heroes of faith in the Bible? They are made for you as well. They are made for me. And God says, just like I was with, with Moses, I will be with you. I will be with you. It's re remarkable that God would say something like this to a human being, to a fallen human being. You know, it is true that God is om omnipresent. That's one of the, his attributes. He is everywhere. God is everywhere, but God promises to be with Joshua in a very personal way. You know, throughout the scriptures, we can observe how God's presence made all the difference in helping people to achieve impossible. You guys know the stories. You guys know the story of a shepherd boy, David, who faced and defeated this giant because God was with him. We know the story of Daniel, who was safe among the ferocious lions in the den, because God was with him. We remember the story of Daniel's friends, three young Hebrews, captives in Babylon, who were placed in a fiery uh, oven, and God was with them, and they survived. We remember a handful of uneducated Christ followers who communica communicated the good news of Jesus Christ to J uh, Jerusalem, Judea, and to the entire world, and the whole world was flipped upside down. Why? Because God was with them. And if God promised to not forsake Joshua, if God promised not to forsake his disciples, perhaps there is hope for us as well, and there is. Christ, God, we just a few weeks ago, we went through Advent, and we talked about Jesus, who is Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. God is with us. In Christ, God is with us. And when Christ went back to heaven, he sent Holy Spirit. And today, if you are a Christian, Holy Spirit dwells in you. And God is with you. And so whatever you will face this year, whatever we will face as a church this year, as we're moving forward in faith, guess what? God is with you. Whatever struggles are in front of you this year, whatever disappointments, whatever um, discouragement you're going to face this year, and you will, because we live in a fallen world, God is with you. And that is very encouraging. It was very encouraging to Joshua, and it is very encouraging to us today. Here's the third point that we see in this passage. is this. Moving forward in faith requires courage, which comes from God. Here's one of the key passages in the entire book of Joshua. This is the key passage of the entire book. In verse 7, it says this. Again, God addresses Joshua, and he says, Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. 
This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Skipping down to verse 9, it, it ends, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. This is the key phrase of this entire book. Be strong and courageous. What an amazing statement, amazing phrase. Be strong and courageous. Just in this, uh, this is one of the most repeated phrases in the book. In, just in this chapter, it's repeated four times. And God says, be strong and courageous, Joshua. That's what you need. And that's what Joshua needed. And at first, it may seem like a, a God wants to encourage him to rely on himself. Okay, Joshua, you know, man up. Be strong and courageous. You can do it. Read a couple of self-help books. Listen to a little bit of Oprah. Listen to that smiling preacher from Texas. And you can do it, you know? You can do it. Rely on yourself. That's not what is going on here. God is not encouraging him to just be man up and be strong, you know, pull himself up by the bootstraps, you know? That's not what the point is here. You know, it's one thing to just say be strong and courageous. And this is the key. And quite something else to enable Joshua to be strong and courageous. And that's what we see in this passage. He's not just telling him to be strong and courageous. He is enabling him. He's providing everything that he needs to be strong and courageous. And what is that? What is the key point of this passage? It's the word of, the, of God. It's the law of Moses. Joshua's strength and courage would come from meditating on the word of God, believing in its promises and obeying its precepts. Now, how exactly, you know, we can right away kind of skip over this and apply this to us. Awesome, we need to be strong and courageous. We need to read the Bible. Let's move on. Well, how exactly does the Word of God, Bible, makes us courageous? How does the reading the Word of God gives you courage? How does that happen? And this is very important, especially it's important in the culture that we live in. Here's the first sub-point. Bible provides us with a strong foundation. Do you guys remember the, the, the parable that Jesus taught his disciples, the parable about building a house on a rock and on the sand? Do you remember that? I mean, that's exactly what this is. Because you know what you, when you know that you, what you're standing on, when you, know, when you have a uh, strong foundation, then you can easily move forward with courage. I mean, that... that That passage is so awesome where Jesus says, everyone uh, then who hears these words of mine, we can apply this to everyone who reads the scripture, everyone who reads the law of Moses and does them, important part, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great, and great was the fall of it. What are you building your house on? What are we building our house on? Is it a rock, solid rock of God's word or are we building it on sand? And that leads me to the second point is that Bible is a strong foundation because it's the ultimate truth. You know, when we take this parable and we look around us in our culture, in our world today, what is this world building their house on? Sand. I mean, you look how shaky and how uncertain everything is in this world, how uncertain and shaky all these ideologies in this world are today, You're like, well, this is because they rejected God, because they rejected his word, they're not obeying his word, and now their house is built on the sand. In the world of relativism and postmodernism, Bible stands as a solid source of time-tested truth. And people are bombarded today with false narratives every day, with media and academia and social media, Ideologies like critical theory and neo-Marxism promote nothing but confusion and chaos. 
And their ultimate goal is to dismantle the fundamental concepts of main ideas of what it means to be a human created in the image of God. Their ultimate goal is to dismantle fundamental concepts of family, family structure, gender, society, law, common sense. And in the middle of all of this chaos and confusion, Bible, the Word of God stands as an unshakable rock, as an unshakable foundation that we can stand on, we can rely on, and this is the truth that we can stand and move forward from with courage. That is the blessing of knowing God. That is the blessing of knowing the truth and having the Word of God. You know, it's interesting, when we read Genesis, I brought up this example before, when, when God is creating the world out of chaos, how does He create the world? He creates the world by speaking it into existence, by His Word. By His Word, God creates order out of chaos. In John, we read that it's the Logos. It's Jesus. And so if this logos, this word does not give you courage in the middle of chaos, courage to move forward in faith, I don't know what will. But there is a requirement in this passage. If we go back to the passage, there is a requirement. It's not just having the word of God on your shelf, in your car, on your phone. It's this, verse 8, he says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Is this true in your life, Christian? Is this true in your life? That is the, the, the question that needs to, that should sober us up as believers. You know, so often Christians, they, they, they cry out and they say, man, my relationships are not working out. My, my uh, kids are not working out. My job is not working out. I'm struggling. I'm falling. I'm stumbling. Are you meditating on on God's word? Is this true in your life? Maybe the reason you lack courage in life because you don't meditate on this book. Maybe the reason you struggle is because this book departed from you a long time ago. So that's why we want to help you and all of us. That's why we put this together so we can together as church, starting tomorrow, you go to this page right here, Uh, Today is sermon part one. You go to this page, starting tomorrow morning. We're going to start in Genesis chapter one and two. And we're going to read it together. Forget about your your version plans. Forget about all that. Read this with us. Discuss this in your community groups. Let's read the Bible together. And what's cool about this Bible reading plan is that we're going to go from Genesis to Revelation. We're not going to do verse by verse, but we're going to highlight these main points in this whole Bible. And by the end of this sermon series, We're all going to be Bible scholars. We're going to read through the most of the Bible and we're going to, uh, and we're going to kind of see this big picture and we're going to, the main point is we're going to be in the scripture. That is our goal and our desire. Here's the last point that I want to point out and we'll move on to communion. It's this, moving forward in faith requires action. So we went from forget your past, you know, move on. We went to let's be in God's word Let's, um, let's, um, let's believe and let's re- be reassured that God is with us. And la- now let's take some action. And that's what we see if we go back to verse 2 of Joshua chapter 1. God says, now therefore, Moses is dead, past is in the past. Now therefore, arise and go. Go over this Jordan, you and all this people into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. Do you notice that that word, the, the last sentence there, it's in the past tense. They're still not there. But God says, I have given it to you. God has already given them the land. But it was now their responsibility to arise and go. Not just to sit and think, man, God has big promises for me. Man, that land over Jordan looks so awesome. God says, now that you know it's yours, arise and go. Arise and go. I will give you that land. Notice the promise did not apply to sitters and waiters. Not waiters like waiters in the restaurant, but waiters, those who wait. 
the, the promise applied to those who took action. Only people on the move. Unless Joshua and people would move forward, they would never accomplish the tasks that awaited them. Uh, a few weeks ago, on, when we had Christmas break, I had a luxury of putting my kids to bed and watching a movie. And I, uh, I watched, uh, even without my wife, because she does not look like those kind of movies, so I borrowed uh, some time and I watched the movie for, just for myself. And it was uh, my type of movie. It was um, a movie about, um, about Winston Churchill and called Darkest Hour. I don't know if, how many of you are into history, but that was just amazing two and a half hours uh, of, uh, of a documentary. But uh, Winston Churchill, he was a uh, British prime minister during World War II. Amazing man, uh, man of courage. And he said one phrase in that movie that, uh, that is really stood out to me. He says this, he says, wars are not won by evacuations. Wars are not won by evacuations. You know, this is so true for us as a church. Churches don't advance the gospel by evacuating from the world. Churches do not advance the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, by hiding from the world. Churches do not advance the good news about Jesus Christ by leaving California because it's too crazy here. Churches are not advancing the gospel by hiding from the world, but by advancing the gospel, by moving forward with the gospel. And so we too, as House of the Gospel, we must move forward. Move, we must move forward and we must take steps of actions. We must get out of our comfort zones. We must get out of our cultural comfort zones. We must get out of our own comfortable houses and our own comfortable lives and we must step out and preach the gospel. We must step out and attend Sunday services. We must step out and attend community groups. We must step out and serve. We must step out and give. And all these things are not comfortable. All these things sitters, waiters, and passive Christians don't want to do. That's why I'm so excited that so many of you are serving. So many of you are giving. So many. This past year was our biggest budget that we ever had in, in our church. Praise God for that because it means that you guys are giving. You guys care for this church. That's amazing. So what steps of action do you have to take this year in ministry, in your personal life? Are you going to be a sitter, a waiter, or are you going to take steps of actions? Let me conclude with this. You know, we're going to do communion today, and I want to leave this to Jesus because the book of Joshua is just an amazing book that points to Jesus Christ. I never want us to read books like these and think about Joshua as the hero of the story. He, he's not the hero of the story. There's actually no such things as heroes of the, of the faith or heroes of the Bible because Jesus is the only hero in the Bible. These people are, are sinful men who point to Jesus Christ. And the point that I want to show is that Jesus is the true and better Joshua. Jesus is the true and better Joshua. You know, it's amazing how the story and life of Joshua points to something bigger, something larger, and it's Jesus Christ and his story of salvation. The story of Israel is not just about a nation 3,000 years ago who wanted to settle in the promised land. It's about God's story of redemption of all humanity. The story of Joshua points what theologians call true and better Joshua, who is Jesus Christ. Because while Joshua was instructed to keep the law, Jesus fulfilled the law with his perfect life, death, and resurrection. While Joshua led Israel into the promised land, Jesus made the kingdom of heaven, the promised land, uh, available to all nations, not just to Israel, but to all nations, to all people in the world. And while Joshua, a mighty warrior, conquered enemy nations, Jesus is a mighty warrior who conquered the ultimate enemy, sin. And while Je Jesus, while Joshua ushered in God's covenant promised to Israel to inherit the land, Jesus brought a new covenant through his death and resurrection. And finally, just like Joshua relied on God and moved forward in faith, we as a church, as house of the gospel, we must do the same. We must rely on Jesus and with his faithful guidance, move forward in faith into this new season. Amen. Let's pray. 
Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you are our mighty warrior, our mighty conqueror who conquered death. You died for us on the cross. You, you conquered death through your death. You resurrected and you gave us life. And Jesus, I thank you that in you we have promises of the future promised land of heaven and in the kingdom of God, and we look forward to that. But also those promises are not just there. Your promises are also applicable to us here today, to our church, to our families, to our life. And I pray, God, that as we as a church, as house of the gospel, begin this new year, begin this series, I pray that you would give us faith, that you would help us to have faith that leads to action. God, please be with our church. We thank you for everything that you've done so far, and we thank you that for everything that you will do this year in our church. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand and worship.